Mark Bear. You're watching Conversations and Collaborations. This is the second part of my interview with architect Thomas Hood. We are talking about art, architecture, design, and the fabulous, exquisite spirit of designer Philippe Stark. Hello, I'm Mark Bear. You're watching Conversations and Collaborations. I'm with Thomas Hood, architect. Uh, this is the second part of our, um, our conversation. Uh, we were talking about uh, glass and putting a huge installation into the Butterfly House in Carmel Point. Uh, and now, back to you and more, more glass. <laughs> Continuing on the glass story. Yes. Uh, taking a, a manufactured product to define condition space. You know, absolutely remarkable material when it was really brought into the commercial market with large expanses of glass in the 19th century in Chicago, you're going from these masonry buildings with these small openings all of a sudden with the, with the creation of the steel frame building, it just kind of blew the whole architecture design world open because now you could have large expanses of glass. And the, the Butterfly House, which we were talking about, really is one of those personifications of, of really opening space up. But the, what's just sort of on the heels of that project being completed as I look back on it, and that was that architect's artistic moment and true expression of glass. The rest of the building is a masonry box with punched openings. So when I had the opportunity to work with the team on, on the butterfly, the great room, it was a reversal of, of a masonry load-bearing building, uh, a 19th century concept, to the concept of the steel frame, right? And that sort of ties me back to the Chicago work. And looking back, that really is his artistic moment there of real originality. And shortly after just getting that just concluded, uh, and the owners are, I think, happily ensconced in the home uh, and the project being completed, I've recently been asked to work in glass again, but this time it's completely different. It's for a, uh, a quite highly regarded national, international glass artist by the name of Tolan Sand who's recently relocated to Carmel Valley from New Hampshire. He's a glass artist. The architect at the Butterfly House was, in a sense, a glass artist in that moment. But now we're talking about sacred objects and working with the raw material itself. And what I'm really excited about is we're about to start the design process with Tolan to create a studio space for him out in Carmel Valley. So now instead of working just with the product that is creating its influences, now I'm looking and I'm trying to look deep into his soul as an artist to say, what happens when you work with glass? What is the inspiration? You know, not necessarily what is just the mechanical process, but where do those ideas come from? And what kind of space can we create together to reinforce your work environment functionally, but also spiritually? And what can that building say about you as a glass artist with that material? And we're talking a very small building. But as I said a while ago, one of my favorite projects was one 300 square foot room. Well, this glass studio and fabrication space may be 450 square feet, which is great because that means we can use every square foot to reinforce the strong idea. And going back to graduate school, uh, I remember our studio at the time, Stanley Tigerman said, uh, in a series of juries, He'd look at a design and he'd boiled it down at one point, which was hard for him to do, to say, if it doesn't, he identifies the main idea. He says, have one good idea. And if another piece doesn't reinforce the idea, for Christ's sake, get rid of it. So he'd peeled back the layers of these elaborate student projects and say, superfluous, unnecessary, stupid, representational. There's your idea. Focus on that. So designing this glass studio is going to be about paying attention and making that space reflective of Tolan's personality, his inspiration, and for those that can come to his studio and purchase a piece, that building is going to not only function as that, you know, as that kind of space, but say send something about him as an artist, because it's a public building. It's then out in the public realm. The glass piece is, a, is like a sacred object that you can put on a table and hold. But now take that same idea and apply it to a very simple little building. That idea is is not just applicable architecture. That's that's every 
thing in the creative process. It's, it's absolutely everything. W you know, what's the core idea? Yeah. What's superfluous? Yeah. And okay, now I'm going to put one other thing on top of this. All the work in the last three years essentially has been residential. What's amazing is with the completion of the Butterfly House and six other projects now under construction, the days are haphazard where questions are flying in and out, and you're trying to keep up with that. But what's happened in the last couple of months is one is Tolan Sand Studio, which we're just about to embark on. At the same time, we're going to be designing a uh, recording studio. There isn't a public recording studio on the Monterey Peninsula, but it's thick with musicians that live here and come through. So going from working with a manufactured object, visual and tactile, is now we're going to be doing another interior space that will be tactile, but are going to respond to sight and sound a space that's going to reinforce musicians. That space has got to do something for them. It's, it's, got to, it's not only got to be acoustically perfect and have all the technologies, but it's, it's another dimension in architectural design that's going to be striking on different chords than designing houses. And it's just as hard because you've got, to, you've got to do something with that opportunity that reinforces all those different things. Most, to me, most specifically, is how that musician feels when he's in that space. Does it matter to him? If it does, acoustically, is it going to work? Technologically, is it going to work for the recording engineer at the same time? Is there going to be something about that space that musicians are going to say, we're heading up the coast, we got to stop in Carmel Valley, let's cut a few tracks up there. And that's, it's a whole new challenge. And as a former musician, I'm going to be thinking about my past when I was lucky enough to do some recording as a kid blowing a saxophone on a flute and imagine what that was experience was like when I was in the studio and see if I can bring some of that background creatively to the process. Yeah, so it's not a matter that they see your work, it's a matter that they almost feel your work. You they know, gotta they feel they it. They don't have to be conscious of what it is. No. But design is, and going back to Philippe Stark, uh, what it is that separates his, they're, they're all elegant, they're all, there's also a simplicity, mm -hmm. There's a, they're all new. Uh, they all seem wabi-sabi and effortless. Well, uh, and they, they all are, they're all sensuous. They're feminine. They're sexual. They're humorous. They're dynamic. They're not just beautiful. They actually work. If you didn't see the first part of this interview, we're, <laughs> we're talking about uh, Philippe Stark, uh, the French designer. A okay, short but, sidebar. Okay. Yes, Architecture. Yes. He's back in, our, in, in his work in, in the, uh, the, uh, the book there, describes some of his work. A couple of photographs uh, in there. Uh, Felix Restaurant at the top of the Peninsula Hotel in Hong Kong. And I was lucky enough to go there about a year after it opened and went up there, hadn't seen the space, hadn't seen but a couple of photographs in the press. And realizing when you walked into that space, it's, you're not a customer that's going to be buying a meal. You're actually part of a story. And the way that restaurant was created, essentially almost like a nightclub floor, and then there's actually an elevated stage, and that would appear to be sort of two clamshells, which could be the balconies, uh, oyster bars, martini bar and an oyster bar, that can look back down and see the crowd down below and see what's going on on stage. Well, up on stage are more dining tables, and the back of every chair has a face. So he's, he's playing a joke on the idea of, we go out to be seen, and every chair had a different face, including his own. And our table ended up having to be on the stage, so we were essentially part of the performance. The people down in, on the tables, they're part of the scene, and the real observers are the ones that are up in these clamshells watching. And it was a, it was, it was a, it was a very physical experience to all of a sudden realize that you're sitting up on stage and people are looking up and like, what are they going to do? Are they going to eat? Are they going to kiss? Are they going to like the meal? So we were part of a story that sort of goes on. He has the ability to create that sort of atmosphere. Aside from, from the, the fantastic lighting and everything else, is he created a story in the space. He is le lux. <laughs> he is, uh, he is the, the money that, you know, he is, he is the, uh, the rich that 
imagination buys and not the rich that money buys. <laughs> I guess that's the, dis the distinguish. Uh, yeah. Because these places are lavish, but so much of it, like the faces on the chair, it's, 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 his, it's his imagination. It's not it's, the materials. It's, it's not the him. thing. It's, it's something that it, it, it could be very simple materials. A lot of his work is very simple, but there's just that he, he brings artistry to it and imagination. And, and his whimsy. work as a result is his... And he lets work it be, is, he lets you it be know a, it when you see it. And it lets it be a little loose. And it's, it, it's, it kind of can be a little rough hewn. And so, you know, for my own work, it's, it's a huge, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a huge inspiration. Well, and his work also conveys, they convey physics, they convey movement. Yeah. He designed a, a, a television set that looked like it was uh, an ice chest. He did another product that literally looked like when it was standing still, it was moving 100 miles an hour. Right, and he did that in his buildings when he did a he did a beer hall in Tokyo, what late eighties, and the object on the roof was like it, it was like a fireball, and that shape, that sensuous shape, has occurred again and again in different ways, in objects, in chairs, in household items, in silverware, in the toothbrush, he uses that feeling of sensuousness and speed, and smooth surfaces. In, in so many different ways. And I, I can't think of another uh, contemporary artist that's, that's done it so well. Yeah. This whole summer, I've been working on big six by nine pieces for, the, for floors, you know, kind of art pieces, but they're, they're design and they're interior pieces because people don't have walls and uh, people are, y y you know, art is such a, a, a different thing than design. You know, it, it, it may be mm -hmm. art or not art, but I'm really thinking of things that, uh, people could live with in their house and and find uh, some some uh, some joy in keeping it a personal expression, but also an expression that I uh, that's meant for uh, you know a, a lifestyle you know that I would want to live in. I'm Mark Bear. I'm talking with Tom Hood. Uh, you're watching conversations and collaborations, and. I will be right back in one minute and Tom will be back with me. You are watching Conversations and Collaborations. For all episodes, go to markdavidbear.com. I'm Mark Bear. You're watching Conversations and Collaborations. I'm with Thomas Hood, architect. We're talking about uh, inspiration, creativity, uh, what inspires us? Uh, we've been talking about uh, Philippe Stark, is how he started this, the French designer. We're talking about the mysteries of design, what uh, and the kind of what makes us tick, us what keeps us. Uh, you know, I I look to you for intensity. You've been so intense the last couple of years, <laughs> and and I feed on that. And as a, as a creative person. Uh, you need people around you that are that are going full out. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I really only am comfortable around people that are going full out because uh, the people who are doing it are all in, uh, in, in any level of occupation. That's true. There's no, there's no, there's no part timers that are really doing the thing. Uh, you know, you want to do the dance, you've got to be all in, you've got to be committed, you've got to be mad for this stuff mm -hmm. and uh, so you for me it's been just a beautiful love thing because uh, <laughs> I've watched the smoke coming out of your ears I've watched the steam come <laughs> off of your head uh, I, Dittos. I yeah and I know yeah. uh, the, the work level and what it takes and if uh, if I call you up and you, you can't talk because you're you're working in a 14-hour day I, I, I'm envious because I want to work hard, you know, because again, <laughs> you are, th that's the only way this stuff happens. It does. Basically. It does. That's the only way the magic happens. Well, and it isn't necessarily always just a deadline. No, no. The magic happens it's, through intensity. It, it yeah, it, it's, and sometimes it's, it's tough to get off that intense wagon and sometimes you have to. Um, but I, I, and those moments for me, getting off that wagon, uh, you know, over, over a given week, for me is, uh, I have a, a few rituals. One of them is, uh, every morning, 20 to 45 minutes, sitting quietly after breakfast, before things get crazy, and reading. Reading something other than architecture. 
uh, and, and, and it can be the Wall Street Journal, it can, it, it can be uh, history, it could be poetry, but taking information in, in, in a different way, in a quiet moment before the day really sort of kicks off. And then at the end of the day, the last 15 minutes, 30 minutes, I might be awake before things finally fall apart, is reading something else. So I, kind of, I bookend each day with, with reading. Uh, if we do a, an intensive, we had a session this morning for like three and a half hours without a 30 second break uh, on this house we're building up in the mountains. And we got a bunch done. They had to leave. And right at that moment, I needed to sort of come up for air. And it was going up in the deck and looking at the ocean for 10 minutes, having a sandwich and just kind of taking it back in again. Okay, now bring it back down and then move into the next act, which would be the next two hours or three hours or four hours. Uh, eating five times a day, but allowing yourself that break, walking around the block, it does recharge you physically and emotionally, but there are those days where it is, it, it's, it's 14, 16, 18, 20 hours, where when you're really into it, you're saying, I don't want to take time to, to have lunch or whatever, and you just power through because that, that, that adrenaline rush is just going to carry you right through. And it's a, it's a euphoric feeling when you reach that conclusion if it's 2.30 in the morning. Uh, just getting vast amounts of work done. It's extremely gratifying. It's exhausting, but it's extremely But your gratifying. ideas come fast. They come very fast. Yeah. They come very you, fast. You're, you're, Harvard, you, you, you're working at a pace now where you're just having trouble keeping, the ideas are happening faster than you're able to write them down. Well, and one and of that's, ways, like, that's, that's bliss. My first project out of graduate school, my first client, before I hired my unemployed grad school friends, uh, was for an old friend. And I spent six weeks designing this 500 square foot building, right? Then we couldn't find a contractor. So I said, okay, I'll be the builder. So I, I literally jumped into the deep end of having to build what I had just designed right out of graduate school. But I spent six weeks refining that concept. And every day was like, what am I going to do? Trying to make decisions. Now, if presented with that same project, I may percolate on it for days or weeks. But when the moment comes, it's one day. And when, or, or, it's, or it's a couple of days. Because you're, you're constantly thinking about it. It's like the glass studio we talked about earlier. We haven't actually formally started the process, but I've been looking at the artist's work, reading, and just reflecting on, I've got to get into the right state of mind to be open to what ideas are going to come forth and what I'm going to hear from the client at that time. And that's really a, it's, it's sort of a warm-up to when you finally start producing that work and of course then developing it and it gets more and more complex but it's a, it's an exciting time because i i don't bring i tr really try not to bring any preconceived ideas particularly when i'm asked to design something new like that is try and start with that clean slate and it really requires for me um not overthinking it but reading other things and just slowly indoctrinating yourself with, okay now we're going to start the process and the speed really is the excitement of the ideas as they start to come out, right? Frank Lloyd Wright says, oh, I just shake the ideas out of my sleeve. Yeah, fine. He'd been thinking about it for years, but he really was truly brilliant in, in that way, that he could crank it out because he knew, he could imagine where he wanted to go. In, in the, my secondary education, not secondary, my undergraduate education, they use the Beaux-Arts model of, of developing a building where you're, the, it's the site and you're dealing with the floor plan, and you're refining the floor plan, then you're creating elevations, right? Well, I had the opportunity to spend a short amount of time studying in Finland and with some Polish architecture students that came to the United States. They did the exact opposite. Their approach was, imagine it completed in your head, how do I get there? It's sort of like, who is the... Uh, Wayne Gretzky said, I don't follow the puck. I imagine I need to be where the puck is going to end up. That's how they approached it. And getting that little bit in, in undergrad is imagining the completed project, the, you know, the building on the hill, whatever it is, and then taking the more studio, the, the, the studio approach of developing the Part T and the floor plan. You bring those two disciplines together and some really exciting things happen if you, you keep both those in balance. You know, just collaborating, having the ability to collaborate with you something, you've been very generous with me letting me, uh, you know, try out art pieces and try out things in, in uh, you know, especially in your new studio. Uh, well, and your, your work to me is, is so fascinating because you're, 
I'm going to lay something on thick here. Okay, is, is your your knowledge of 20th century art, theater, music, dance, poetry, art history is encyclopedic. And here we are sitting in front of 2,000 of 5,000 books that you've got. It's, it's This is like a dreamland for me. But being able to take all that and move from a background as a writer and a screenwriter where you're dealing with print and then dealing with film, and all of a sudden you call me up and you're a painter and you start off this big and now you're doing six by six. I, I don't know, you're going to move to sides of buildings. But you're taking all those different aspects I just described and you're putting it on canvas. And it's, it's with words and it's with images. But what I think is fascinating about working with you is you're doing it with such joy and reckless abandon that you'd get done with one and I'd say, well, what about this? And you go, doesn't matter. We're just going to flip that canvas over and we're just going to do it all over again. So the amount of work that you have been able to produce while you're working in this relatively new medium. Do you remember when you started with three school paints? Yeah. Now you've yeah. got this... 16 foot long table yeah. that your, your supplies your yeah. supplies are, are commensurate with your expansion of your ideas and the work just gets more and more engaging. Well what I'm, what I'm finding is again what you're talking about imagining the finished thing uh, you know I'm working six by nine feet canvases that I imagine on, on floors double-sided pieces because people don't have walls but they do have uh, and they don't want to define themselves by their art, but they will define themselves by what they'll, their design. It's, it's just an easier thing for people to, to do. Art is a very judgmental thing. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, yeah, and so people are, are careful, in if, and they don't really want to put themselves out too much very often. But with design, they're, they're a little more carefree. Uh, well, neither of us know where the piece is going to end up. I didn't want to mislead to say, yeah. I imagine every project finished. Yeah. Um, but... Knowing that eventuality, that the eventuality that it's going to be something there and allowing the rest of the process to take you there. When I watch you paint, I don't know if you know where you're going to be in 10 minutes, but I know that you're drawing on all these different, all these different interests and backgrounds with, with history and, and with, with art and with dance and film that it's all sort of pouring into those pieces. So I, so I understand that process and how to make it, but what I'm seeing, you know, with, with the excitement and what, you know, I hope we can continue to do is I can see with materials how I can, you know, cull it down, you know, it, again, it's a multi-year pr project to cull down just a few images, you know, the few iconic things that really resonate, mm -hmm. and then e expanding them with different materials, with metals on, you know, with, with fabrics, with, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, lampshades, with tables, mm -hmm. with, with the, the Philippe Stark, those chair backs, you know. Yeah. So I, I want my work to leap off the traditional canvas well, it, and leap, leap everywhere. In a sense, we, we, we sort of, by your asking me to come and, and, and think about the exhibition you had over at Museum of Monterey last year, yeah. you actually did that. You were not only working in Porcelain tiles, you work in canvas, you work in paper, but it wasn't just it wasn't just two dimensional. Is you made your pieces three dimensional by some are on the wall, some are on the floor. We looked at hanging pieces off the ceiling that you can take you can take that piece and it's a floor cloth, right? Or it's an object on the wall, or it's it's any number of things, allowing the I want to say the collector, the user, the person that engages that piece to take it and, and use it in different ways functionally, but also uh, mentally in their heads. All those pieces create a different response with people, but the overwhelming one that I saw watching people come in is where you're taking it and you're, you're expressing it on the floor, but then you're taking all those layers and putting them on a screen. And the look on their face was, was one of, of being mesmerized. I mean, they just locked in to those video monitors and what I see you've been able to do is go from a series of small monitors to bigger, but that the story is much more connected. There are six stories going on, but there's an overarching tone to those pieces that if you've got trees and multi-images going on the side, that they create part of that framework, which is the essential story, which is happening in the center screens. But then sometimes it bounces over to the left or bounces over to the right. And you got to pay attention. Yeah. And I'm hoping then, you know, with my work is that anybody has a single piece, 
can go you know, online or check it out and find out how it hooks to a bigger piece. So each individual piece that a person has, they have a part of a story that's part of a, of a bigger story. Well, and and, and the, yeah. you know, and it, it's it's related to a bigger thing, and and, and that's that's how I hope the, the design works. Your your work is is for me. Your work is so dense with all the different references and influences. Is I'll sit there one time and just listen to the bass line, the soundtrack, the musical soundtrack that you've laid down, and another one. This is on, this is on the multiple screen on the multiple part, screens. Part is it, yeah. is then I'm just listening to the music background and how it's tying in. And another one, I'm really concentrating on the spoken word. And then other times, I'm concentrating on the peripheral screen. So every time I've sat through one of your pieces, there's another layer that, for me, I don't take it all in at once, but to me, that's kind of what's interesting. You know, for me as an architect, you go and visit a building once and you don't find all of it. And when I'm designing, I don't try to put all the groceries up at the front of the line, is that the buildings, as corny as it is, they tell some sort of story. And there are some elements of surprises that you don't encounter and discover all the, the spaces at once. And there are views and orientations that you only see if you come back and look again and saying, okay, that window has a perfectly framed orientation to the tree that's outside that's significant. And trying to do that is that takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of paying attention. And when I, when I watch your work, it requires paying attention. And it's, it's, it's just extremely engaging in that way. Well, what I'm, what I'm hoping with the vi video work uh, is to build enough trust that people can take uh, the work on canvas or, or you know, the, the work that is meant for design and meant to go in somebody's house uh, can trust it enough because it's it's unique. And uh, there's there's and, a and, there's and, a dialogue and, 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 with and, and, each and piece. it's rough and it's like does it hang together or is it not hanging together? Is it bad? Is it good? Is it awful? Uh, it can be all those things, but I have to have enough trust. Is it ugly? Is it you know whatever it is? Is it ridiculous? Does it make sense? Not make sense? Whatever. I have to build enough trust uh, that they'll allow that. You know, it's a matter of you know it's it's, it's a matter of trust. Well, I mean. Being probably the largest uh, personal collector of your work in Carmel, I have what, eleven pieces of yours up, thirteen. And God bless, I, I, I worry, that's why I, I, I pray for you at night, worry of your health. <laughs> <laughs> I will say this: is no one walks by one of your pieces, whether it's under the glass coffee table, or it's out in the courtyard that you can see from the street, or it's in the dining room. No one just walks by; they always stop. They say something, they laugh, they tilt their head. What does this really mean, right? But it, it, it provokes. Positive, negative, happy, sad. It elicits an emotion. And good buildings and, and strong, powerful art, it elicits, it elicits a response. If, it, if people are, are, are literally tone deaf to the art, it's a failure. And Starks does that. It's, it's not only functional, it, it, is, it is beautiful, but it's not just beautiful. So this is a great touchstone, Philippe Stark. Good stuff. I'm with Tom Hood. This is Mark Bear. You're watching Conversations and Collaborations. If you're out there watching us want more, call us. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're here. <laughs> we're in the yellow pages. <laughs> 1-800-LOVE, baby. <laughs> okay. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Conversations and Collaborations. For all episodes, go to markdavidbear.com. See it now. Don't wait. Thank you.